Thank you very much, Mr. Dondo. In the interest of time, I'm just going to press on quite quickly. My name's David Pilling. I'm the uh, Africa editor of the Financial Times. As was said to me outside this hall, we've spoken a lot this morning um, uh, about what needs to be done. Uh, this panel, I think, um, is going to discuss how. Um, the focus is very much on technology uh, and on efficient um, procurement. Um, we have uh, representatives of some of the um, highest companies in the world um, that participate uh, in this sector. If I can introduce them quickly um, to my left, we have Gino Thielen, the Vice President of Engineering and Technology at Slum uh, We have Roderick Larson, um, President and CEO of Oceaneering. Uh, Dan Benson, Senior Director of Commercial Offshore at McDermott. Um, Ado uh, uh, Osabaje, um, the Vice President uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa of BHGE. Some of you will know this, Baker Hughes. Um, and finally, Greg uh, Rago, uh, Regional Director for Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa um, at Halliburton. Um, now, some things have very much changed uh, in uh, Angola. We have a new, new or newish um, president, uh, old of new talk uh, about um, Angola being open for business. And clearly, um, as evidenced by the number of people that have turned up for this conference, a lot of global interest in Angola. And yet, some things remain the same. Uh, the oil price um, is still pretty weak. Um, not as weak as it was, but still fairly weak. Um, and most significantly for this panel, the oil is still pretty deep, <laughs> and perhaps getting deeper if we're exploring um, further. If I could just quickly kind of go along the, the panelists and just, and just ask really what sort of technology is being developed or is now available that, that can be used in Africa in general and specifically here in Angola to tackle this fundamental issue. So, His Excellency the Minister, uh, Honourable uh, Members of the Ministry uh, Agency and, uh, and some of distinguished guests, I think from, um, from some of perspective, uh, the technology portfolio falls into three teams that are applicable to Angola. And I think the first one, and it is, is very clearly mentioned by the panel members before, is uh, resources are there, it's just a question of what is the risk to profitably, economically uh, exploit them. And I think uh, our business is basically providing the technologies to help operators to de-risk assets. Um, and particularly when it comes to deeper environments, where we've seen uh, uh, examples like seismic while drilling uh, and formation testing while drilling, which have been uh, you know, one of the first uh, pilot areas where we've used it here in Angola. Uh, the second one is uh, around production efficiency. Um, as already mentioned in the previous panel as well, uh, a number of uh, producing assets are, are in decline and uh, basically helping to uh, restore production levels even if it's by 5 to 10 percent uh, has tremendous economic value. So I think what we see there is uh, efforts that we do in, in our digital portfolio because obviously you need to, you can only act upon what you can measure. And I think what we see today is that uh, with all the instrumentation that we can put on subsea trees, that we can put inside wells, uh, we have a much clearer and actual picture of what's going on. Um, and we've been building our portfolio at Somerset in terms of intervention technologies to basically uh, cheaply uh, intervene wells to make sure that uh, production is optimized at any point in time. And a third one is, uh, is very much more at the uh, upfront R&D stage, and that is has been mentioned by a uh, well member of Total, is the uh, ventures into the ultra deep water, where really we go back to, uh, to material science and trying to understand how the tools that we have uh, behave at extreme environments, and how can we go forward in helping our customers to, uh, to basically make sure that uh, whenever they want to drill in ultra deep environments, that we have the reliability of the tools that they expect. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the attention of our distinguished guests who remain with us today. Um, I, I think I, I would reiterate, first of all, uh, what we heard on the previous panel and also what we heard, uh, what, what we just mentioned here today is, is that while you have reservoir decline, natural reservoir decline, 
we also have mechanical issues, and I think those mechanical issues too uh, that are that are significant here in, in Angola are are those that are related to those things that happen within the well bore. It can be mechanically remediated, and so you know access, uh, as we spoke of before, uh, low cost, safe, reliable, and consistently pr uh, productive means of accessing the well bore and, and bringing wells back online. That's that's one that uh, then you you get back to just the limitations of natural uh, natural decline, natural reservoir decline. The second is is keeping uh, an aging infrastructure available and ready to use, and that's you know as we start to see sometimes pushing infrastructure beyond design life, we need to be able to inspect, we need to be able to maintain, we need to be able to repair that infrastructure to make sure that we have access to those wells that now we've just remediated. So I think. All of those, and those done with a greater consistency, with a greater reliability and a greater predictability, I think are, are going to be key going forward. Are the mechanical problems particular to Angola, and is that because we have an aging infrastructure, as you say? And, 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 and not, not necessarily old uh, in compared with, with the North Sea or the Gulf of Mexico, but it's just generally speaking, some of the, some of the first wells that were brought online are now you know, reaching that, that 8 to 10 year level where we start to see some of those issues appear. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much to uh, all of the ministries and the distinguished guests uh, and the organisers who have made it possible for Moderna to uh, take part in this uh, panel session today. Um, I think uh, to address your point specifically with regard to uh, deep water opportunities in, uh, in, in Angola, um, McDermott is currently investing in a uh, ultra deep water uh, J-Day vessel. Uh, which will be uh, converted in Rotterdam later this year uh, and its first project will be in Mauritania, Senegal, uh, the Greater uh, uh, Anaheim Tortu development on behalf of BP. Now this project is in some 2,800 meters of uh, water depth um, and she is genuinely a uh, world-class deep water uh, vessel. So I was delighted to uh, hear from the gentleman from Total with regard to the fact that some of the blocks that uh, uh, Total are looking at in Angola are starting to touch the 3,000 meter uh, water range. Uh, this vessel uh, will certainly be a credible player uh, to undertake that type of uh, work scope. Okay, anything else or is that, you, what you want to highlight the, the, the vessel? Okay, great. And um, go on to uh, uh, Abdul, please. So, Her Excellency, the First Lady, Honorable Minister, Thank you so much for your time and staying to, to the end of the, the day's program. Um, I think what is, what is important as you look at the, the current state of the deep water market, not just in Angola but globally, is thinking back to um, having a change in mindset and trying to figure out what we're trying to solve for with each particular problem of field development and looking at what technologies are applicable to the problem. And one of the issues that we, we found in the previous upcycle was that everybody wanted the biggest, shiniest, newest thing. Whereas today, the mentality is more to figure out what is the best fit and what is good enough. Because today, in this cost environment, good enough will do. And so, to that end, and coming specifically to Angola, one of the things that, um, or the main opportunities that we see here is around the tiebacks, these marginal fields that um, there's a lot of talk about with the legislation changing and uh, creating opportunity. So um, an approach that we're taking is around what we like to call subsea connect, where we really try to bring together the main elements of a field development and we feel that with subsea connect we can address about 30% of the cost areas related to uh, subsea or an offshore field development, which starts to have tremendous value and starts to bring the, um, the uh, field development cost or the unit cost significantly down. And when we did a survey around the impact that this could mean, you're talking about accessing almost 16 billion barrels of additional reserves globally. So taking that approach, looking at what is actually required, what is the best fit, and applying the technology portfolio to the particular problem starts to have a significant impact on the cost. So in layman's language, I mean, this is squeezing more out of existing fields and then out of the periphery, what I would call the, the margins of those, of those fields. Is that right? Without needing to 
start all over again. So, that yeah. is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, and if we could move on to, to Greg. Um, so sorry to keep asking the same question, but basically, you know, what technology can you bring here to help in this process? I mean, first of all, squeezing more out, out and, and then perhaps in, you know, developing new areas, new fields. Sure, I'll speak to both, both those parts. Thanks very much. I'd like to add to my predecessors in thanking our distinguished guests uh, for your attention and to the audience as a whole. Uh, with regards to technology, uh, we know that Angola has a long history of implementing very advanced technology from seismic acquisition, processing, imaging that was used to really unlock the prolific basins to the technologies that are used to harvest that oil and gas in the deep and ultra deep water. Uh, with the uh, release of the new exploration blocks, I'm, I'm confident that we'll need those innovations. I like this innovation or die theme. I, I think it's absolutely right. What I'd like to speak about, though, is, is technology to drive efficiencies. And I think this technology is maybe even more important if we go back to where we started, which is where oil prices are today. There's tremendous pressure on utilization of capital, and efficiency is, is key in Angola as it is around the world. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time at Halliburton on using digital technologies specifically to increase capital efficiency in well construction, in the actual construction of wells. And uh, my colleague from Total spoke at, at a little bit of length about the use of uh, data analytics, uh, enterprise architectures, cloud, industrial internet of things. But to make this realistic, we're working with clients to take the workflow of planning a well in uh, deep water uh, Norway from six months to less than a day. And these are, this is real data. Uh, we're taking that additional work to automate drilling to the point where data machines are being used to drive down the number of people required on board. These changes are sustainable and they inevitably drive our costs down and drive the, the cost down for the industry as a whole and get us to where we need to be around efficiency. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Dondo, um, you know, I guess you're a, you're a user of some of these technologies. I mean, you're also a developer, but you know, which of these technologies do you find most most attractive, most interesting in terms of what you need to do? Thank you. Uh, I would like to rebound on what my predecessor, all of them, had said. That you know, currently, as I said previously during my presentation, is to say that we still have 1.5 billion of barrel to unlock on this so-called mature field. Yes. So this comes first by maintaining our base, I mean, keeping the efficiency of the current installation, how efficient we can run them, and we are open, obviously, to use all the technology, mainly, as I've said, not only say that we are working those talks, I mean, currently, today, on Block 17, we have shifted our operating mode, using extensively the data, using the so-called uh, smart rooms, we're really remote from the base. We are using the data to make all operation efficiency, take the right decision to do the good enough maintenance, really, definitively. And the next steps is really to unlock all the additional barriers, the tie-ins around. So we are working extensively with all those guys to make sure that we have a new approach of tying in the far reach object that the new project we are bringing on stream to connect the far reach object, to revisit the way we think about flow assurance, the way we think about connecting far reach objects, and also expediting all the processing of the 4D seismic and so on to define the new target. Okay, I'm gonna start with you again, Mr. Dondo, because I'm gonna have a quick round on data, if I may. I know if some of you have touched upon it, but I just want to kind of challenge you a little, because I think there may be some different views on the on the panel. You said, you know, data is the new oil. Um, I mean, is it, is my question. You know, I mean, I, uh, I tried putting data in my car the other day and it just didn't run. And, uh, um, you know, how confident are you that there, that not only is there enough data, but that that data can be used in such a way, um, you know, that, that creates genuine uh, efficiencies? Because, I mean, you know, big data can blind as much as it can. Um, you know, narrow people down. Okay, uh, ju just to be more concrete instead of uh, giving uh, rough ideas, let me give an example quickly. Uh, nowadays we are doing condition-based maintenance of, of, of our major equipment 
using all the data we are taking from fields on the condition of our machines, running them to the machine learning intelligence really, and to define when to do our maintenance store. In the past, we have been doing a calendar-based maintenance, typically after X millions of hours of running equipment, we decide to do maintenance. But nowadays, with new data exploiting, all the data we are gathering from our sites, we can decide really based on the condition, the real condition of the machines to do the maintenance. Typically on Block 17, we've been able to save a lot of money on doing such ways. So when we talk about data, we are not only saying it, but we are really walking the talks and we believe that that's our next really benefit. We've been able in Angola to be the pioneers in developing deep offshore fields I think we will be the pioneer also in unlocking value using data. How do we just, where is the data analyzed? Is it analyzed here in Angola or does it go back to the Definitely. HQ? They are analyzed here in our offices and we can link to our offshore sites to gather all the data and with new algorithms we are able definitively to run those data and to take the right decision. Right. Uh, Greg, it sounded as though you were a convert to this, is that right? You're yes. a believer. I, I, I am for sure, and I'd like to pick up on your auto analogy if I could. Okay? So uh, you, might not be able to, you might not be able to run the car on data, but certainly you can see data that might be able to drive the car for you, right? So you look at what Google's doing and Volvo has done and what's happening around the driverless car, and this is fundamentally founded in data, right? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to extend that, that when you think about this driverless car, it's it's the combination of data that comes from the inexpensive sensors on the car, the ability to take that data and process it in Angle in the cloud, uh, or very fast edge devices, uh, the, the uh, technology within the car, GPS, et cetera, that allows this car to drive itself. And that combination of data becomes effectively a, a digital twin for the real world. Uh, what we're spending a lot of time on is creating a, effectively the digital twin for our, our clients' assets. And this is something that may not happen all at once, but certainly you can take chunks, uh, the drilling data model, the reservoir data model, and you can start to put those pieces together. So you effectively are working your way towards this ultimate goal of having an asset digital twin, the same as the digital twin you need to implement a driverless car. Right, and um, Adla, you, you spoke about, you know, good, good is enough, you know, it, it, I mean, that, that sounds almost like, you know, sort of a, an old fashioned technique. We're now talking about, you know, moving forward with using new techniques. Are, are you also a, uh, a so, believer in data? So when you, when you think about data, you, you made an interesting point. Um, I think at the moment we actually have more data than we can handle. Okay. And the challenge isn't collecting more information. The challenge is making that information relevant to, to the case and transforming the data into an actionable decision. And this is really where I think the industry is trying to move to, where all that information we get, we can organize it in a way that um, is digestible, uh, such that the user can take an informed decision based on that data. And it also comes with a significant challenge, in fact, two significant challenges. One is authenticating the data such that it's um, you can actually validate what that information, what the reading is you're getting from the sensor. And then the second one is something that's very topical, not just in our industry, but globally, is around cybersecurity, right? As we digitize and as we go into this, um, into this new world, ensuring the, the integrity of the network, right, really becomes very important. And there have been some, you know, a few cases where, um, having a virus or having a breach in the network can cause serious problems or serious havoc to the integrity of the system. So um, the industry, and we're part of that move, you know, with a lot of what we've done with our control systems and the cybersecurity service that we offer in ensuring that it's not just understanding the asset and what you can do with the asset, but also securing the integrity of that asset becomes fundamental. So, so are these your own networks or do, does this have to run over the the national network it, as it were it runs so depending on customer or country they create their own they could create their own um 
closed loop network. Right? Well, I'm thinking that they have the control access to access between Europe and America now, for example, with Trump saying that they won't share intelligence with, you know, with Britain, if, for example, if it uses Huawei. I mean, would that be a problem um, uh, in Angola? Um, or can you can you guarantee that that this data stays within your own company? I think it is it is at the forefront of what the industry is trying to wrestle with, not just. Um, data residency in terms of you asked a very valid question about is the data analyzed in country so does that production information or whatever the information is stay in the country yes. and then even the interfaces between company networks so I as a service provider um, to Total how do I interface with the Total network and how does Total assure themselves that there won't be a breach coming through my end at the junction point right so these are many questions that the industry as a whole is trying to deal with as we move into this new industrial world. That's, that's fascinating. Dan, what would you like to add? Um, so I'm a, I'm a great advocate of data. I think it's uh, cool. Um, when we were talking earlier about uh, sustainability of the industry and uh, attracting uh, new people uh, and new skills and new talent, uh, certainly at McDermott, we're seeing um, our uh, investment in uh, digital technology, um, bringing people in from the aerospace industry, uh, bringing people in from uh, the, the space industry, um, uh, obviously centered around Houston, but there's no reason why that couldn't be transposed uh, anywhere globally where the, uh, the, the talent uh, is available. Um, so I, I think uh, data is, is certainly uh, the, way, the way forward to bring new talent into the industry. Um, I'd also like to make uh, just two other comments. Um, one is using digital techniques to undertake projects. Uh, one thing that we are very, very keen on in McDermott is making projects uh, efficient. Um, and we've been doing that by using a, a digital project management system, which allows uh, us and our clients and our partners, uh, BHG, on a number of these projects uh, to work collaboratively in a, in a cloud space. Um, and this has reduced the project cycle time of a, of a number of projects that we've been working on in this manner um, by nearly 18 months. So out of a, a five-year project cycle, that's quite a significant reduction in, uh, in, in, in project life cycle time. Uh, the other final point is uh, just when I think back to my experience of working offshore uh, when I was younger and fitter, um, I used to work in the North Sea uh, and it was always very inefficient when we mobilised to a platform um, and you wouldn't really be prepared for what you were going to face in terms of how the equipment was laid out, uh, how, how there were interface clashes, etc. Um, so at McDermott I've been uh, able to work with some of our uh, virtual reality technology, uh, putting these headsets on and, and basically being able to familiarise myself with the offshore platform before I mobilise uh, to the site. Um, and that would uh, significantly reduce the amount of time that it would take to get uh, permits to work established. And it would also increase uh, safety and reduce risk. Uh, Presumably by in the future, you won't have to visit the site at all. You could do it all in 3D uh, <coughs> well, there, there, <laughs> with your goggles on. Yeah, so um, there are a number of uh, technology aspects that people are looking into. Equinor, for instance, um, are certainly looking at uh, robots and robotic uh, capability offshore to reduce the level of manning that's required uh, uh, to maintain these uh, offshore structures. Right. Roderick, have they convinced you? <laughs> well, I guess at the risk of being a contrarian here, I, I fully believe in the power of data. And we have, great, we have great examples of using augmented reality today to fly ROVs in low visibility environments and things like this. But, but I do think we have to ask ourselves, we, we're talking about efficiency a lot today, and, and it's a pretty well agreed upon fact that in our industry we use about 3% of the data we collect. 3%. So you say, is, you know, are we masters of the data or is the data masters of us? And, and so you know, instead of being better at, at finding the needle in the haystack, we're building bigger haystacks. And so take it back to, I think, for us to be really effective with, with data, we have to ask ourselves what we're collecting it for. And, and I, I, would, I would say especially taking it back to benchmarking, taking a very high level view and saying, you know, what is optimal here? And, and when, we, when we decide what's optimal for just high level performance of, of a subsea asset for example and say start benchmarking 
and start doing that at a granularity level that we can actually find the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve for. And once we do that, I think we'll clean up our data a lot. We'll get to a better, uh, a better accumulation of data that matters rather than data that we can just, you know, we measure what we measure. We don't always measure what matters. And I think that's a secret for us to be better at using the data and getting to these phenomenal solutions a lot more quickly. Okay, that's a very good point. What you measure is, uh, you know, tends to be what you actually end up doing, you know. Um, do you know quickly if I could just ask you, and I, I suppose I should throw in, I mean, it, it, are we moving into the world of AI here, or is it, or are we stopping short of that? No, I don't, I don't think we are. I think data is, is an enabler, and, uh, but it has to support the business. And, and if, if I go back to the two teams I mentioned, um, you know, data is a big enabler when it comes to de-risking assets. I think if we look at the workflows hasn't changed, the computation engines that uh, the engineers are using have not changed. However, what is changing is just the data sharing where if a GNG model is prepared, uh, it goes to a drilling engineer and he says, what if I drill more well then and don't drill it there? Uh, when in the past you had to bounce it back to a previous department, today with the data share, you can very quickly update all simulations. So the, the workflows are happening a lot faster and a lot better collaboration. Right. So that's, that's one side. And then the other side is on the production efficiency where, where we see, you know, I think the, the the upstream industry, to some extent, is, is a bit behind on, on, the, on the downstream industry, which have had you know, process controls and automation for a very long period of time. And I think it's, it's mostly due to the fact that you know, our, the, the simulation of the, the processes of what happens down hole and, how, and the surface network is a lot more complex. And today we have, you know, we have, we, we have the physics, we can fill in the gaps with AI, um, and now we can probably adequately monitor and basically you know, give actionable items to the engineer or surface on, in terms of valve settings on how to optimize and basically how to squeeze the extra barrel out of each valve. Right, we have 10 minutes left and I want to just bring one um, uh, new theme into the discussion. Um, so you, if you can tell, if you can do the maths, you have less than two minutes each, but let's, uh, let's try and see what we can do. This is the area of procurement and efficient procurement. I mean, I'm a layman, you know, the, the stuff's there, it costs money, you need it, how can you procure it more efficiently? Yeah, I think this brings us back to, uh, you know, the, the, the oil field service industry in general. It, it, we do a balance, we strike a balance between mature technologies that are brought to the market at a competitive rate, um, and our investment into newer technologies that basically we put at the market at premium in comparison to the value that they bring to our customers. I think what we've seen over, uh, over the last uh, four or five years with the down cycle is we had a very prolonged period where the industry is focused on the one side of the balance for us, which is basically uh, commoditized services. Yeah. Uh, that hasn't taken away that uh, we've not invested into new technologies, uh, but it also has forced us basically to focus on our own internal working and how to optimize our product lifecycle development, how to optimize our internal human processes, uh, uh, and also things that we, we started many years ago in terms of investing in, in developing local, uh, local talent, talent uh, to basically run, to run operations in the places that we work. And I think the result of that investment early on is that today, uh, for our company, we are 89% uh, Angola nationals working in Angola. Right. At, at all levels of management. Roderick, in terms of... Perfect. Certainly. I, I think we have a challenge where recently, to, to, to the point earlier, is that we've, we've allowed procurement to become a wall between, a lot of times, the supplier and the customer. And, and when that happens, we get down to pricing line items of things that we think we, already, we know that we need versus solutions that, that could be. And so, you know, finding a way to, to, to build a partnership so that you can allow um, a, a solution to be to be vetted and to be procured that actually um, maybe is is a direction that you wouldn't have even gone. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have put a line item in a procurement exercise for that particular product. That's a challenge for us because if we keep doing it on line items with price, we're going to actually be rewarding those suppliers who aren't wasting any money on innovation and quality and you know and local content and diversity and all the things so it's that are a false really economy basically the, the things that will take us to a different level right so how do you make that balance down between uh, yeah. i better move on i'm sorry just no. in the interest of fairness how do um, you get the balance right so i i'd like to just step it back a little bit um in the all procurement that's driven by design 
So if we look at a, uh, uh, an example of a platform that we did a number of years ago, um, because of the client's specifications for a lighting um, requirement uh, and the amount of uh, light that was actually available in a, in a given space on the, uh, the platform, we had essentially 42 different types of light bulbs on that platform. So they're so, over-engineered. So, correct. So if you can, take, uh, if you can reduce the specification uh, by 2-3% on a, on a given item and take vendor-led experience in that regard, you can then reduce the amount that you're procure, procuring right. and obviously then make yourself more efficient uh, and reduce costs. So get the design right and be as simple as possible. Adler. So I think in, in the past three, four years, um, we've, we've all been focused on, on survival on both sides, right? And this has led to, I think, a kind of competitive um, procurement process. And I think that going forward, if, if we're to have kind of sustainable growth in the industry, we actually have to collaborate a lot more. Right. And that's very easy to say, but it's the hardest thing to, to achieve. And I think that the service side needs to be brought on a lot more upstream at the, at the idea generation yeah. and the concept selection uh, stage, such that what we propose then really addresses what the actual issue or what's been trying to um, the operator is trying to solve for, right? Okay. I think that, that for me is, is fundamental. Uh -huh. The other thing is okay. capacity, uh -huh. right? Of what the last three, four years has done in terms of capacity in general in the industry and that being more efficient as to how we use resources becomes important as well if you want to maintain a certain cost level for our, for our industry. Right. We talked about collaboration but they've left you about a minute each. <laughs> That's right. right. I'll, I'll take a minute. Uh, so I'll pick up on that same point, right? It, capital utilization, it, procurements thinking along uh, delivering key performance indicators where we're aligned around utilization of capital. That's a great start. The other thing I would add is just two things is, first of all, uh, some of our colleagues spoke about agility. So we need procurement to be just as agile as we see the market dynamics are becoming everywhere, including Angola. And then the final, final one is transparency. Transparency to scope, transparency to schedules. Uh, the more that we know in advance around what's coming up, what the project's gonna entail, uh, the better prepared we are to price effectively to deliver the returns that we require and also to deliver the success that you require. Mr. Dondo, final word to you. Are you gonna collaborate with these guys to improve? Yes, uh, definitely, uh, I would say first collaboration should be between uh, ourselves as clients, we know that most of our purchasing uh, are toward trying to keep the stock uh, on board and the amount of our stock is huge enough that uh, our neighbor could have the same item in his stock. If we can share it, at least it will ease all the process. I acknowledge the effort done by agency recently to help on really uh, transferring stock between operators and uh, helping to have this uh, capacity. And uh, collaborating with our contractor, definitively we need to embark in a working together man spirit that those guys are bringing to us all what we need and uh, if we work definitively giving them a clear view of what we need and what will be the outlook out there, I think we can reach a very good level in terms of collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Please thank our panel for what I think was a very uh, fast-paced, interesting discussion. Thank you so much.